What is the Gospel of Mary? As the only known gospel that is named after a woman, the Gospel of Mary provides an intriguing glimpse into the kind of Christianity that had once been lost for over 1,500 years. The Gospel delivers powerful new revelations on the nature of Jesus' teachings, the qualifications for apostleship, Mary Magdalene's clear preeminence among the disciples, and the process at work in the early church that would eventually lead to her marginalization. This astonishingly brief narrative presents a radical interpretation of Jesus' teachings as a path to spiritual knowledge. Unfortunately, not very many people are familiar with it today, as this gospel was written early in the second century CE and then disappeared for more than 1500 years. But in the late 19th century, a miracle happened. A fragmentary copy in Coptic translation was discovered. Unfortunately, fewer than nine pages of the ancient papyrus survived, meaning that about half of the Gospel of Mary is still lost to us. That said, the first six pages of the Gospel of Mary are missing. And so our journey begins with the text on page seven, where we see the Savior, Jesus Christ, teaching the apostles a valuable lesson. Teach us about the material world. Will it last forever or is everything impermanent? The Savior responds to the apostles, saying, All nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. For the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then Peter said to him, Since you have explained everything to us, tell us this also. What is the sin of the world? There is no sin, but it is you who make sin when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. That is why the good came into your midst, to the essence of every nature, in order to restore it to its root. That is why you become sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. He who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Pages 8 and 9. Attachment to matter gives rise to incomparable suffering because it goes against your true nature. Then the whole body becomes disturbed. This is why I taught you to find contentment at the level of the heart. When you feel disturbed and out of balance, reclaim wholeness in the presence of all the different forms of your true nature. Those who have ears, let them hear. When the Blessed One had said these things, he embraced them all and took his leave, saying, Peace be with you. Cultivate my peace within yourselves. Be vigilant and don't let anyone lead you astray by saying, Here it is or there it is. For the Son of Man, the child of your true humanity, already lives within each one of you. This is what you should follow. I tell you, those who seek this within will surely find it. Go then and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules other than what I have given you. Do not establish more laws like the lawmaker or else you too will become constrained by them. Once he had said these things, he departed from them. The disciples grieved bitterly shedding many tears and saying, How are we supposed to go out preaching to the rest of the world, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they did not spare him, then what will become of us? Then Mary rose up. She embraced them all, kissing them tenderly, and began to speak to her brothers and sisters. There is no need to remain stuck in sorrow, grief, and doubt, for his grace will be with you all. It will guide you, comfort you, shelter, and protect you. Rather, let us be thankful and praise his greatness, for he has brought us together and prepared us for this. Through him, we too can become fully human. Saying these things, Mary turned their hearts inward toward the good, and they began to wrestle with the meaning of the Savior's words and to discuss his sayings. Page 10. Then Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that you are greatly loved by the Savior more than any other woman. Tell us those words of his that you remember, the things which you know and we don't, the teachings we never heard. Mary answered, saying, What is hidden from you I shall reveal to you. Whatever is unknown to you, and I remember, I will tell you. And she began saying these words to them. She said, Once I saw the Lord in a vision, and I said to him, Lord Rabuni, now I see you in this vision. He answered me and said, Blessed are you, Mary, for you do not waver at the sight of me. How wonderful you are. For this is where the treasure lies, in that place where heaven and earth meet, where deep understanding arises in the heart and mind, the nows. Now tell me, Lord, how does a person see such a vision? Is it through the agency of their soul or through the spirit? It is neither through the soul nor through the spirit, but through the understanding which arises between the two, that is how the vision is seen. 
The verse presents us with a fascinating glimpse into early Christian dynamics and the roles of women in religious contexts. In this passage, Peter acknowledges that Mary Magdalene has a special and close relationship with Jesus. He recognizes that Jesus loved her greatly, perhaps more than any other woman, and asks her to share teachings and words from Jesus that the male disciples had not heard. In his statement to Mary Magdalene, Peter acknowledges her special status. His statement indicates that Mary Magdalene had a unique and privileged position among Jesus' followers. This suggests that she was more than just a passive follower, she was an active participant and confidant in Jesus' ministry. This has significant implications considering the roles of women during that time. In the first century Jewish context, women generally had limited roles in public and religious life. They were often expected to remain in the domestic sphere. However, this passage suggests that Jesus' ministry might have been more inclusive, granting women like Mary Magdalene significant roles and access to teachings. The fact that Mary Magdalene had access to teachings not known to the male disciples implies a deep level of trust and an intimate teacher-student relationship between her and Jesus. This could suggest that she had a profound understanding of Jesus' message, potentially placing her in a position of spiritual leadership. The text highlights a close, potentially unique, bond between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Some interpretations see this as purely spiritual and intellectual, while others speculate about a more personal relationship. In the New Testament, Mary Magdalene is depicted as a devoted follower of Jesus who was present at his crucifixion and the first to witness his resurrection. However, her role is not emphasized as a primary recipient of Jesus' teachings over the male disciples. But the Gospel of Mary and other non-canonical texts present a broader picture where Mary Magdalene has a more prominent role, sometimes as a leader among the disciples and a recipient of esoteric teachings. But that's not all. The close bond depicted in the Gospel of Mary has led some to speculate about a romantic relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. This is supported not only in non-canonical scriptures, but also in myths and legends. The idea of a romantic relationship between Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene is especially popularized by modern works like The Da Vinci Code, which suggests that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and had children. These stories propose that a bloodline of Jesus exists, preserved through descendants of Mary Magdalene. Unfortunately, pages 11 to 14 are missing. However, the next passage from the Gospel of Mary on page 15 offers a rich allegory for the spiritual journey toward enlightenment. The soul's encounters with craving, ignorance and wrath represent the challenges faced in overcoming earthly attachments and ignorance. Through inner realization and spiritual insight, the soul achieves liberation, illustrating a path of transformation and transcendence that emphasizes the impermanence of the material world and the enduring nature of spiritual truth. Page 15 in Craving spoke, I didn't see you descending, but now I see you rising up. Who are you fooling? You're controlled by me. The soul responded, My friend, it is you who were mistaken. I saw you, but you never really saw me or knew me. You mistook the cloak I was wearing for my true self, so you didn't recognize me. Having said all this, the soul went away joyfully. Again, the soul came into the realm of the third authority, which goes by the name of ignorance. This scrutinized the soul closely and interrogated it, saying, Where do you think you're going? You are the slave of malicious habits trapped and held prisoner by your own wicked inclinations. You lack discrimination, so your judgment is unsound. The soul said, Why are you so critical of me, even though I have not been judgmental? I have been dominated and have lacked my own agency. I was never recognized for my true self, but now I have recognized this, that everything is impermanent. The whole of creation will be dissolved. All worldly things, all heavenly things, everything passes, everything will be released. Page 16. Liberated from the realm of the third authority, the soul continued and came face to face with the fourth, the authority of wrath. This took on seven fearful manifestations. The first was everything obscured, the second was craving, the third, ignorance, the fourth, the longing for oblivion, the fifth, enslavement to the demands of the body, the sixth was foolish worldly wisdom, the seventh, the hot-tempered certainty of anger. These formed the sevenfold authority of wrath, which interrogated the soul, demanding, Where do you come from, murderer? And where do you think you're going, deserter? The soul responded, It is what dominated me that has been vanquished, and what was steering me that has been overcome. It's my craving that has come to an end, and my ignorance that has died. I have been set free from one world with the aid of another world, 
from one pattern through the molding and shaping of a greater pattern. I have been liberated from the chains of forgetfulness, which are both temporary and temporal. From this moment on, now and for all seasons, I am released into silent restfulness, where time rests in the eternity of time. Some of the text on page 17 is missing. We move now to page 18, where we see the text shift focus back over to Mary and the Apostles. After saying these things, Mary settled into silence, that place of sanctuary to which the Savior's words had brought her. But Andrew responded and said to the brothers and sisters, Tell me, what do you think about all that she has been telling us? Say what you will, but I for one don't believe that the Savior would have said such things. Certainly, these are unorthodox teachings. It all seems quite different from his way of thinking. After some consideration, Peter responded in a similar way. He questioned the brothers about the Savior. Did he really speak secretly with a woman and not openly so that we could all hear? Are we just going to turn around and listen to her? Did he really choose her and prefer her to us? Surely, he wouldn't have wanted to show that she is more worthy than we are. Pages 18 to 19. Then Mary wept. She said to Peter, My brother Peter, what are you thinking? Do you really believe that I made all this up or that I would tell lies about our Savior? Levi also responded to Peter saying, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered from the beginning, and now we see you arguing against this woman as though you were her adversary. Yet if the Savior deemed her worthy, indeed if he himself has made her worthy, then who are you to despise and reject her? Surely the Savior's appraisal of her is completely reliable, that is why he loved her more than us. Brothers, we should be ashamed of our behavior, let us cloak ourselves with true humanity. We too can follow his instructions and cultivate this in ourselves. Let us do as we were instructed and proclaim the good news the Savior taught, never laying down any rules or laws beyond what he himself gave. After Levi had said these things, they started going out to teach and to proclaim the gospel.